Welcome everyone. My name is Blake and I will be your moderator. I'm excited to welcome Dr. Stephen Vorholt for a deep dive into the unique ways to leverage 3D printing in dental surgery and implant treatment planning. Before we get started, I'd like to take a moment to go over some housekeeping. If you have a question, please type it in the box labeled, have a question. Henry Shine is not offering CE credit for viewing or attending this presentation, live or on demand. Welcome and thank you for being with us tonight. I will pass it over to you now. Hello everybody, thanks for joining me uh, this evening. Uh, my name is Stephen Vorholt. I am the lead instructor at Implant Pathway down in Tempe, Arizona. Um, and tonight, we're going to be diving into 3D printing with Sprint Ray um, and some of the more maybe clever or adjunctive uses that we're using it for at the clinic and during our courses um, that are outside the scope of just the normal printing a surgical guide or a night guard or something like that. So um, it's titled 3D Printing in Action Surgical Anatomical Models, and that might tip my hand a little bit about what we're talking about. But we're going to be talking about the different ways that we can use our 3D printer to help us in larger surgeries. So let's talk about the objectives of the webinar first. So here's a case that we're going to get to kind of towards the end of this webinar, um, this larger case with um, some pathology. But what we want to do tonight is understand the many different ways that we can pull data out of our CBCT, okay? data that we can actually 3D print. Um, so that's something anyone with a CBCT and a 3D printer can do what we're going to be talking about tonight. There's no other necessary equipment, no other special, um, you know, processes that you need to know. Um, Want to understand how that this is actually the first step of all of those larger stackable guided surgeries um, that are really popular, really sexy on Instagram and, and YouTube and all that stuff you know, where you're doing, you know, Chrome guided smile or NDX and sequence or whatever it is. Um, this is the first step that someone is doing, usually a lab. And so we're going to kind of demystify that a little bit, explain how it is we're going to use that. And maybe you could utilize it yourself if you want to learn how to make the guide yourself or um, maybe just as study models. Okay. Um, so we're going to talk about using these anatomical models for advanced treatment planning and then during the surgery for surgical execution, having this actually chair side with you, um, with you and the patient, is going to give you a lot of maybe help immediately. Because, you know, it's nice. You can say, oh, I got a CBCT. I got a patient right here. I can see the anatomy. Well, if it's kind of bloody in there or there's a lot of gauze or a lot of commotion or just, you know, it's nice to be able to look at a clean model before, during, and after the surgery and kind of come up with um, maybe use that in the middle of the surgery as well. So how do we go from a CBCT rendering, which is what all of our CBCTs will have, to a clean printable model or series of models like we have here on the right? Um, there's several ways to do it. There's tedious ways. There's inexpensive ways, all the way to the non-tedious but expensive ways. Uh, but you can see how most CBCTs, and this is an Acteon Prime unit, um, can give a general outline of a, a rendering. You know, this is just the CBCT taking the Hounsfield units and having some sort of narrow range that it decides is something to render. So anything from bone to enamel, for instance. Um, and then on most CBCTs, you can, you can adjust the slider of what Hounsfield units are actually being displayed. And so you can change it to see the bone or the soft tissue or what have you. Um, but it's not something you could just click a button and print that. You have to convert this rendering into a 3D printable file. So a couple of different ways to do it. One of the first ways that I learned was in Blue Sky Bio. Um, Blue Sky Bio is a free software that <clears throat> is, uh, they charge you to export things. So you can do all sorts of fun stuff inside the software on CBCTs, surgical plan, guided um, design, making you make dentures and, and teeth and ortho and all sorts of stuff. And it's all free to mess around. And then once you want to export and bring the file out, you pay some sort of export fee, generally around a $20 export fee um, to get a 3D printable file. So you can manually do this bone segmentation in Blue Sky Bio, and it's it can be very accurate, but it's extremely time consuming and tedious. Mm -hmm. And essentially what Blue Sky will do is they'll run you through this little wizard and they'll say, okay, what's what area do you want to segment? Okay, so here we have the area that you can see is slightly highlighted, the lighter gray, and it'll give you about 10 slices of the axial portion. So it'll, it'll cut into tenths and you will paint with your mouse um, this pinker portion that you do. So I'm painting each slice and it goes to the next slice. And I'm, as I'm painting, I'm basically building 
a little kind of 3D model. And then I have to paint going uh, sagittally and coronally too. So you're painting what the bone is that you want to segment out in each of the three slices of a CBCT radiograph. Uh, and then we can export uh, a, a model for you. So it costs you about 20 bucks and quite a bit of your time. Um, there's videos on YouTube, from Corey Glenn, Baron Grutter showing, showing how to do this. Um, for most of us, this would just be a way to do it without having to pay someone too much money uh, and twenty dollars. But it, once again, it's just the most tedious way. There's better ways. Okay. Um, in the software we use at Acteon, um, our Acteon CBCT has Real Guide 3D. That's the backbone software that utilizes the CBCT viewing, and they have basically a slider adjustment for Houndsfield units, kind of like I was talking about for the rendering. And you can see the rendering there. If I s adjust the sliders until it's it's what I want it to be, and it's kind of showing me the segmentation it's giving me on the other three panels in green, this is like a slightly upgraded version of what Blue Sky Bio does. So this allows you to just kind of set, and if you like what the rendering is, you just hit apply, and it gives you the segmentation. You can go in there and, and paint and correct things as well, but this is maybe like a faster version, like half automated, um, as far as how to get some sort of model. So this might be really nice for just getting a really quick and dirty mandible. Like I just want to get a mandible that I can print and look at or or just have a 3D file I can put on my laptop and spin around if I wanted to or even load it on your phone and spin it around. Um, it doesn't cost you any export fees if you already bought the license for the real guide software. So you know there's a cost there. That's a yearly cost. But if you already had it because you're doing a lot of surgical guides or something like that, it's not going to be an additional ding um, that's going to cost you any money. So that might be kind of a slightly easier way to get it, a little faster way because you can just pick a couple sliders and then and then correct some stuff as needed. You could, so here's that example. Okay, so here's a real guide 3D. We selected enough of the mandible. That it's, you can tell it's not the cleanest. There's little tags here and there from the scatter of the x-ray because that's going to show up. Um, you know, maybe the patient had earrings, you're going to have an earring sticking off the bottom of this mandible or what have you, but it's kind of rough. You can smooth it in software. You can you can print it and put it in mesh mixer and kind of clean it up a little bit. Uh, this is a lot of additional backend work, right? So this is, it's quick, simple, but not the most accurate, okay? You could send it to a lab. This is a lab that I've used for years with success. They're really responsive. Usually 24 to 48 hours later, I will get the segmented models. And I know the lab is using Blue Sky Bio to do it. It's just you're paying someone else to use their time to do it. So because uh, it'll send you the Blue Sky plan file and the, just the, the STLs, the 3D models by itself. A little bit more expensive, of course, than doing it yourself and exporting it. So 50 to 100 bucks. Um, I think they're fantastic to work with. We've used them for a couple of years doing our sinus course. So when we do a sinus course, we will print the hollow maxilla so that the surgeon for their first sinus can kind of see inside the sinus, which is uh, a nice because most of that surgery is done by feel. Um, they'll send it to you via Dropbox. They send you an invoice through PayPal. Um, it's pretty easy to work with them. Um, but 50 to 100 bucks, let the lab do it. Great. That's what we used for a long time. There are some new ones out there, though. And this is why I wanted to do this webinar, because I think there's some new interesting options. Um, there's a lot, I should say, four or five artificial intelligence companies out there now that are there to read radiographs 2D pans, 2D FMX and now 3D cone beams. And this is one of the companies, they're, they're called Diagnacat. If you export your CBCT into their cloud, um, which is linked to your account, and of course it's all HIPAA compliant, this cloud, for $49 they will read a CBCT. Okay, they also have, from my understanding, they have monthly subscriptions that might be a higher price but include unlimited or some limit um, to bring that cost down a little bit. It doesn't just give you the segmentation. And $49 is still, if you just use it for the segmentation, it's still less expensive than using a lab, a little bit more expensive than doing it yourself. Um, but it also will kick out a radiology report for you. So it'll give you it'll give you a patient chart. It'll chart missing teeth. It'll chart restorations. Um, it'll chart caries, root canal, pathology. Now, it's not going to alert you or diagnose, do any differential diagnosis like a radiologist would, but it'll alert you to pathology like, you know, maybe A number five looks like as they've collapsed. It kind of gives you a pretty nice printable sheet. Um, 
it's waiting on the full clearance from the FDA. They're currently in beta in the U.S. You can get I know in Canada it's live. Um, I've been talking to them and they say it's kind of any day now. Um, they'll be able to just you'll be able to just log into the website and upload stuff yourself. But it's completely cloud based, which is nice. So let me show you kind of what that looks like inside. So on on the cloud, um, in the cloud space in the software, you log in, and I've got a patient here that I uploaded. Um, and you can see it kind of gives you, it draws the curve for you and gives you a rendering of the pano right away. And so you can order different analysis. And then the bottom screen, you see there's a radiological report for CBCTs. So if I click on that, it's a, it's a long form PDF. And then the second one down there, the STL, it will, it will segment everything from the teeth to all the different bones, the nerves, airway, sinuses, it segments everything. So let's take a look what that looks like. Here's the radiograph report. You can see on the left, it go ahead, it charts for you. It shows missing teeth, uh, treated teeth, and stuff that is uh, unhealthy. So the red teeth are unhealthy teeth, the blue ones are treated, and obviously the red X'd out teeth are missing or gone. So it kind of gives you a nice little tooth chart. And then as you're scrolling down, it will give you different things on each tooth. So here, for instance, we have tooth number five. It says, hey, there's one root with 100% uh, like, you know, accuracy or 100% confidence. It's a confidence rating that the artificial intelligence says that this has one root and a 99% confidence rating that it has one canal. It will go on and, and talk about what it sees with confidence ratings, coast, cast, post, and core, this and that. Um, and it might even show you little slices of each tooth, some pathology, and then you can either approve it or say, no, nah, I don't, I don't agree with that. And it, once you go through each tooth or each segment, you know, spit out a nice PDF radi radiograph report um, that you might be able to put in the patient's chart, for instance. Okay. But the real reason we're here is for the segmentation. So $49, I would pay that just to get the segmented jaw bones, but on top of that, you get all of this nice stuff here. So you go into the segmentation panel, those STLs, and it allows you to see all of the STLs. And it will break down from soft tissue, we can just read them here on the left, soft tissue, the cranium, so the skull base, right, the zygoma, the base of the skull, uh, the nares, and then the maxilla, the mandible, the canal, the IA canal, the airway, and the incisive canal, right, in the, in the midline of the palate, and every tooth. And so you can toggle on and off all of these things and the soft tissue, which is just kind of funny. Uh, but if, if you had a CT and the patient is smiling, you may be able to use the soft tissue as an idea of midlines and that kind of stuff. Uh, but let's take, let's get rid of the soft tissue and look at what, what's there. This is how accurate this segmentation is. It's phenomenal. So you go from what was a pretty rough outline from just doing the sliders in Real Guide 3D to doing it yourself, which takes a lot of time, having a lab do it, and they're very accurate at the lab, but 100 bucks, to this thing that spits out in about four minutes. So you upload your DICOM to the cloud, four minutes later, this is available. You can download all of these pieces, each individual tooth, um, each individual jawbone, et cetera. So what can we do with this? Well, we can overlay this into our treatment plan, we can, we can bring it back into our CT, we can look at more specifically at the root form of the teeth, we could 3D print the teeth if we wanted to. Um, but what we really wanna do, whoops, excuse me, I just full screen my own screen here. What we really wanna do is be able to print this. Okay, so here we have the real guide 3D, quick, inexpensive, rough draft. Artificial intelligence version, $49, about five minutes, super accurate, easy to print and you can toggle on and off the teeth and the nerves. So here I have this model we're talking about, okay? So we have the 3D printed model. You can see the mental foramen in each one. I know my lighting's a little bit dark. Here we go, so there's a mental foramen in, in each jawbone. The teeth have been segmented, so we're looking at the sockets. So this is a really good, indi this is like what you're gonna see once you pull the teeth, right? All the way to the lingula, right? And the uh, where the IA starts, and if the scan allows, you've got you've got the you know the joint up here and the coronoid process and whatnot. So just having this chair side either as a patient education model, uh, as a surgical model, as some sort of reference is really nice. And for forty nine dollars, it's a pretty clean um, little model there. Okay, so 
how do we get this stuff to go from our computer screens into our hands? Well, 3D printing is the answer to that. Um, 3D printing is, I think, the highest return on investment in any dental equipment. Dental equipment by itself is so expensive. I mean, there's no question there's a dental tax on stuff. I mean, if, if you were to buy CBCT when I did back in 2000 and, uh, what was that, 2016, you know, it was 125000 That was kind of the entry level. Now that's come down a little bit. But still, by far and away, 3D printing was never – that expensive. I mean, ten thousand dollars will get you pretty much a full suite. Now it's it's crept up a little bit, but for less than twelve thousand, you can get the entire ecosystem for some, for a company like Sprint Ray, and that allows you to print models, surgical guides, night guards, dentures, crown and bridge. I mean, it's it's amazing, and I feel like every month there's some new resin coming out, and it's. It's not necessarily the future of dentistry. I used to say it's the future of dentistry. When I started 3D printing in my private practice in 2018, you know, this was cutting edge. Now it's it's there. Like the future is here. If you if you don't have a 3D printer, you're, in my opinion, kind of behind the times. You know, you're not you're not near the cutting edge anymore because there's so many applications for the cost. My goodness, it's 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 so inexpensive when you consider the outlay of most other dental equipment. Um, you know, doing even bringing your aligners in house can can save you the return on investment there could be almost fifteen hundred dollars a case if you start printing your own um not the aligner themselves but if you start printing the models for it so big fan of 3d printing i think the ecosystem the sprint rays come out with this really clean really nice their newest line of printers 95 and 55 really kind of hit the whole spectrum of what you could possibly need most of us are going to be in the 95 which is what 90 percent of the stuff we do the 55 you start getting into crown and bridge immediate load um you know, all NX prosthetics, um, you might be looking at 55 as well. But most of us were very comfortable at the Pro 95 level. And then the wash and dry and the cure stations as well, just kind of make it all in a nice, tidy package. Um, you don't have to make a big mess to get through this, and your staff can run most of this. Um, so for printing one of these, here's that model I just showed you. And we can see it's going to take about two and a half hours with some model resin. And I'm just doing – layer thickness of 100 microns. Um, it's about a 42 milliliter print. So that's six or seven dollars in material because you're paying about 150 per liter, okay? So it's a it's a good amount of resin. There's no question. Surgical guys are usually looking like four milliliters of resin because they're really small. Um, so this is a lot of resin, but still we're in the, less than $10 in materials. So, you know, it takes about two and a half hours, print it overnight, print it during lunch, whatever. Um, but it's not very, very expensive. Not very expensive at all. So at Implant Pathway, we use these all the time for our surgical hands-ons. Um, our hands-on, we segmented the nerve out. So when we do bone segmentation, we ask them to remove the nerve, and it makes it really easy. So we'll actually go ahead and print some of the clear resins. And when we're doing the um, hands-on, we can, we can actually see the nerve. And I'll sometimes inject it with some polyvinyl siloxane just so we can see it a little bit better. So let me jump to the video real quick. Because we made the nerve hollow, we can just go in there with some light body, inject it, make it nice and easy on ourselves. And then as we're doing our model surgery, piece of cake. You know, we've, we've got the nerve right there we can watch. So we can watch the nerve right there. And so our model might look something like this. You know, we've got, we're done. We did our alveoplasty, so we're practicing our alveoplasty on these models. Uh, and we place our implants, two behind the foramen, four in front of the foramen, and it leaves the ability to kind of practice. Now, I would not recommend in your own private practice using your implant drills on a resin model. That's a bad idea. It will dull them. It will it will be a mess. Um, but you might do a, a, use a throwaway acrylic burr in the lab and just give yourself a rough idea of the alveoplasty you're looking for. Okay, I would not recommend throwing in six implants for fun. That's an expensive experiment. Uh, but here at Pathway, we have some dummy implants, the BioRisons uh, supplies, and, and we'll utilize this for that reason. But so here we might have an example of an overdenture. Maybe we're trying to do straight up and down implants. So is it possible, you know, those are short implants in the back. You can even see through the model now, just, just fun. This is just like fun surgical kind of adjunctive 3D printing stuff. But we can see exactly how far enough we were, away were with the six millimeter implants in the back. What if we did um, all in force? What if we wanted to practice our angles? So same thing, you know, angled implants, we can practice avoiding the nerve. How far back can we get? What's our maximum spread going to be? You know, so we're not putting implants behind the framing in this example. 
Um, we'll just take a look at this same model, just different treatment plan. And we can see kind of where our angles are. You can see that the angled implants are just missing, you know, the mental loop and so on. So that's a neat little adjunct that we, you know, we utilize 3D printing quite a bit here at Pathway. Okay, so the Pathway hands-on, which the model I have is right here. So here's a model before we've done our hands-on, right? We've got my nerve, just like you saw in the video, I've got my nerve drawn in light body polyvinyl. Okay, this is before we've done our alveoplasty. So we still have the tooth roots, and this is an actual patient case. So here we say, okay, we're gonna treatment plan this, do some alveoplasty. So here you're gonna sneak peek at the implant pathway fast track. Those of you who have taken it will recognize that those who haven't um, kind of get a sneak peek. So here's our patient, Michelle, and Michelle has some terminal teeth. She's got three uh, teeth and one root left. So we're gonna make a plan for an overdenture. So let's go ahead and plan it out on the CBCT with our proper reduction, 12 to 15 millimeters from the occlusal plane. We're gonna do some short implants in the posterior, some four six by six Bio Horizons tapered shorts, and we'll do three eight by 12 Bio Horizons tapered pro in the anterior. So here's the actual patient case. Patient case, we do a full thickness flap and we expose the lingual uh, plate and the buccal plate. We remove the teeth. So now we have a model that looks exactly like the one we're gonna utilize in the hands-on. Okay, so we've removed the teeth. And we do, here's a picture from the, just from the direct facial, so we can kind of appreciate the ridge form here. And then the surgeons did their uh, alveoplasty, which is, they didn't need to do much here, just some light alveoloplasty here. <clears throat> and then we jump into together, we'll treatment plan the case. So we jump into our Acteon software. We're just showing where we can get a four six by six implant to fit. So in the posterior, you know, the nerve is only about nine millimeters away. We can fit a six millimeter implant, still have plenty of safety zone. We can be a little bit, a little bit lingual. Um, so we avoid the nerve, but we're also avoiding that mandibular undercut in the myelohyoid region. And then as we're treatment planning forwards, trying to keep the, um, you know, the connection of the platform or implants relatively um, the same level across the arch. And you can see we're straddling, in this case, the premolar or the canine. Uh, we wanna put our implants in the first molar, first premolar and lateral incisor locations if we're gonna do six straight up and down. So as we work our way this way to three, eight by 12, and then here's our final plan. We can appreciate you know, where we're gonna be placing the anterior implants in regards to the sockets. So how are we going to how are we gonna get our osteotomy to be between number 27 and 28? Maybe we'll use a Lindemann drill after our alveoloplasty to kind of drag our osteotomy and get it right in between the two sockets. Um, so we plan this all out together and then we go into the hands-on room. So we're using our sockets, you know, we're looking for lateral incisors and first premolars. So here's that model. This is the non-clear resin that's on the screen here. So we have our model, we're gonna, get our hands-on motors at 30,000 one-to-one, right? So we get our th a throwaway acrylic burr. We're not gonna use real alveoloplasty burrs. We're not gonna use our real kits because we're gonna just, this resin is very stiff, right? So we're gonna go ahead and do some alveoloplasty and just kind of practice getting that nice plane and that reduction. We're gonna measure from our mental, we're gonna use our anatomy, right? So we know how, long, how, how anterior the loop went on this patient's IAN. So we know we can cheat four millimeters in front of the mental foramen and place the back of our implant. <clears throat> we place our implants just like we will in the mouth. We place two in the front as our kind of our goal posts. And then as we use those pins, we leave those pins in and we go back and we continue to go back and forth and back and forth. Make sure those four implants are nice and parallel. And here you can see the four osteotomies that have been drilled in the model and the implants that we're going to be using. In the posterior, we go with the tapered short, which is its own drill kit. That's a guided, a keyless drill kit for the tapered short by Horizons implants. The line marks six millimeters, and if you bury the line, it's seven and a half. So just showing that we're gonna go just a little bit more than six millimeters to place our six millimeter implant in the back and wind up with something like this. So that hands-on takes us about 45 minutes, but we get to experience all the way from treatment planning, veloplasty, implant place, placement and in the newer models that are clear of course we can see the nerve we can kind of afterwards we can polish the model afterwards engage uh, how how good we were as far as where we are with with our um, treatment plan 
Okay, so that's how we do it down a pathway. But how would you use this, you know, in clinical practice? Okay. Well, we can use our we can determine the proper alveoloplasty and remove the extra bone digitally. So we could print these post alveoloplasty STLs and then continue to reference that during surgery. I need to go until it's the same width or I have this much socket left, right? So in a case like this patient here, we've you know we've we've measured because the teeth were there up 15 millimeters or what have you, and we've decided we want to do some alveoloplasty. So digitally, you know, we can go from this model to this model. You can see we've done our alveoloplasty. The planes are different here. Okay. And so we could just print the alveoloplasty model. We could measure with a perio probe the depth of these sockets. So we could do this right now. And then in the mouth, we can continue measuring. And we just say, hey, let's go until this matches what's in the mouth, right? And then we know we have enough of our alveoloplasty done. So lots of different opportunities for that. You know, we have the patients, this is the, that patient's maxilla. And there's zygomas as well, and some of the uh, nasal bones here. Um, so this is without any reduction. Of course, we've even got the whole sinuses. We've got the top of the sinus. This is what the artificial intelligence segmented out, the top of the sinus, which is kind of crazy. So we're actually we're in the eyeball here. And if we wanted to print out a smaller version, you cut off all this extra stuff. Here's our alveoloplasty model. So we can see where we're going to be finding out. We can measure from the... You know, the nasal floor down, we can measure how much is left in each of the sockets. We can measure the width of the ridge that's left and give us a good idea. Uh, coincidentally, this is also what we would do for sinus surgery. We would print the hollow version. So all we've done is digitally taken this model and kind of chopped right through this level here. And now we have this nice hollow sinus model. So those of you who are uh, doing lateral sinus lifts or interested in lateral sinus lifts, you could even pre-plan your window position. You could draw it out. You could drill it out. And in the mouth, you could measure from the crest up or, or try to just determine where your window needs to be. But better yet, you can see the anatomy on the floor of the sinus and the walls of the sinus, which is something, like I said earlier, is mostly done by feel. And so if you say, gosh, I'm, I feel like I'm hitting something. What is that? Oh, look, there's a little septum you know, right here on the floor in the posterior part of the sinus that I need to be aware of so I don't tear my membrane and lose graph containment. So um, just some of the examples that we're using these models for, okay? So let's take a look at the patient case. Just so you can appreciate how kind of amazingly accurate this is, um, just from artificial intelligence, this is the five minute, five minute $49 thing. So it segmented out the teeth, um, the jaw bones, and even the nerve canals. You can see the incisive canal there. So just after we flap, just comparing the two. So once the teeth are out, Here's what it looks like on the model on the left and in the mouth on the right. And then our post alveoloplasty model or digital model and then our post alveoloplasty real life uh, case, which we lost a little bit of buccal plate in the um, looks like six and eight and maybe a little bit of 11 dehiscence, which of course, you know, we, when we did the digital surgery, we did it perfectly. So we did not lose any buccal plate, uh, but we can get an idea that, yeah, this matches and we know based on where our plan is. So if we go back to our plan, here was our plan locations for the implants overlaid on top of the models that the artificial intelligence spit out. And then here's the actual presentation of the case, right? So we know, okay, we're gonna be actually behind seven and eight. So the lack of a plate on eight is not much of a concern because we're actually placing it in this bone that is, that is native bone um, palatal to it, which is typically where you're gonna be placing a lot of implants for overdentures or fixed cases. And we also have our two posterior implants. And so when we look at it from um, this view where we've kind of turned the translucency up a little bit on the model, we can even appreciate where on the root spacing our implants are planned to be and how far under the nose and, and in front of the sinus, right? So it's nice to kind of have confirmation during the surgery of that and just feel really comfortable that you have full understanding and control of the anatomy of that particular patient and you're not getting into places where you shouldn't be going right so really 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 important on this patient too we did a lateral window sinus we noticed hey if we want to put more implants that are behind the first premolar for upper overdenture we recommend six implants for a maxillary overdenture we only have about 
three millimeters of bone below the floor of the sinus, and most of this implant is going to be sticking into the sinus. So how about we do a lateral sinus lift? So there's our window. Once again, using that model to know exactly where to draw that window, understanding the contours of the inside of the sinus, and we can place our implant, uh, and we just have a really nice kind of guide almost to know exactly where it is. The perfect lateral sinus lift situation where it's this nice, big, deep bowl and a pretty flat floor um, and no septum or anything like that. So it's a, it's a nice um, case to showcase the use of these models, digital or otherwise. So the final plan versus the final result. So we can appreciate kind of where, where we are root spacing wise in our implants. Um, really, really cool. Really cool. And so, you know, you could just spend the $49 or do it yourself and have this on the computer. You can spin around or overlay on top of your CT. You don't have to have the physical model. The 3D printed model is really nice to be able to hold and look at and, um, and consult with during the surgeries as well. So speaking of sinus surgery, I already mentioned it a couple of times. Um, here at our lateral sinus course that we do three times a year, uh, we'll usually print out one model per per um, doctor, per attending doctor. So each doctor will get one model and they'll do the other uh, three or four surgeries without a 3D adjunct. But it's just kind of nice to showcase that, that that's an option. Okay, that that's an option. I'm gonna jump to the video of that now. So here just showing kind of what that, what that model looks like. Right. And in the surgery itself, we're bringing that model right to the patient's chair side and we nailed the window access thanks to that 3d model that adjunctive 3d model okay what else could you do with the sinus surgery you can be as clever as you want with this kind of stuff i mean i think um one thing that i've learned the more i meet and talk to people is just how clever you can be once you start bringing in 3d printing and modeling work and whatnot so here we have a really kind of a dirty version of a sinus window guide. And so in this example, we actually planned some implants in the sinus at an extremely inappropriate angle, but just so that we could make a quote unquote guide um, that would look like it was gonna help us in the sinus window. So here you can see that window and I'm gonna play this video real quick. Let me jump over to screens. Okay, so here's that window that we designed. It's just gonna rest on the bone and the two teeth, and that's important. So you notice the picture here, the flap matches exactly the, the size of that window. And so it's really important that you have uh, the flap done the same way so that that guide can rest on that bone there. Here you can see the surgeons use that window guide to uh, go ahead and make the window in the exact spot and just less questions, right? Less questions during surgery, which is what it's all about. So here's that guide, a little bit more detail, um, just showing where that's gonna rest on the bone and the window that it's opening. We wanna be in lateral sinus surgery, you wanna be two millimeters or so up above or apical to in this case, or superior to the sinus floor. And what that does is it, it gives you a little lip, okay? So like once you do your window, there should be a little lip on the facial or the, or the lateral wall, and that helps to help contain your graft and it's easier to uh, approach the sinus from that angle. You don't want to be right at the floor because you might miss. If you're inferior, then you're just cutting through the alveolar bone, which is bad. If you're too high, it's hard to get your instruments kind of down that steep angle. So about two millimeters above, kind of like you see in this picture on the left, is where you want to be, ideally. Um, and then you can see the length of the window as well. We want to be about two to three millimeters from the anterior portion of the sinus for the same reason. So we want to be able to reach the anterior wall of the sinus for the most the most forward anterior extension of the sinus. So your window should be three millimeters or so from the anterior wall and two millimeters or so up from the inferior border. And so having a guide is nice because it kind of puts you right there without having to do a bunch of math and measurements in the mouth and, and that kind of stuff. And here's the post-op. And you can see the window design, 1.8 millimeters, the plan was two, 3.8, the plan was 3.6. So that guided window put us right in the perfect spot. Now the surgeons could have done a little bit better job getting to that anterior wall with that bone graft. Maybe maybe we should have widened that window a little bit on the, um, on the anterior portion. But nonetheless, the window, as far as the guided version goes, worked out beautifully. 
Okay, how are some, what are some other uses? What about, we talked about some full arch bone board guides earlier in the objectives slide, but it's important to understand if you get into this kind of guided surgery, that you have to have segmented models. It's a, it's a bar none, no excuses, because you're gonna use the, the bones themselves to fixate the guide to. So let's go through a quick workflow, just so everyone understands, if you're not doing these now, kind of understand the four parts and pieces that are necessary. So we have our patient segmented models, this is the picture on the left here. Um, teeth included or not included, doesn't matter. And there's two options. You've got an option in the middle, which utilizes the patient's current dentition to place your pins. And so you're using the patient's teeth to make sure that you get an accurate vertical stop. Okay, so you have some way to know these are where the pins should go for the rest of the surgery. Or you could do direct to bone guides, kind of like you see on the right. And those are just gonna, they don't need the teeth at all. They're just use, using the actual contour of the bone. So a good accurate segmentation is absolutely vital. So either way you do this, you get the pins included. And then using that, that middle guide, that's the one that's uh, fixated right to the bone, that also functions as your bone reduction guide. So that would be giving you an idea of what the plane is of what you're aiming for. Okay, so we do our bone reduction here. It's just been done digitally to just show, showcase what we're aiming for. And then as your implants are planned, like they are on the left, there's another guide, in this case, a separate guide that goes in the same pinholes. So everything's going in, into the same exact initial spot. So everything kind of stacks on top of each other. Um, and that's the implant placement guide. Okay, so what that does is allows you to kind of keep the same video, the same everything from the very, very beginning. Now, this is a very tedious version of doing this kind of surgery because in this example, you have to remove the guide and put this new guide back in using the same pinholes. So technically it's still accurate because you're putting them back in the same pinholes. But once you take it out and it's bleeding, the flap kind of relaxes, you've got to now get it back in. So stackable guides are ones that use a foundation guide, similar to what you see in the middle here. It'd be a foundation guide that is your bone reduction guide. And then the other guides would actually stack or snap or magnetically adhere, or however it is, there's lots of different ways to do it right on top. That way you're not removing the pins and the guides over and over again. But just understanding that the main steps include a bone segmentation and some sort of guide that fits intimately to the bone surface and is not a tooth borne or a soft tissue borne guide. Okay, so in this example, here is the patient case that was planned for a fixed case. And then in the surgery, you can see the patient's teeth the teeth are utilized to put the pins in. There's the bone reduction guide on the top right. The pins fixing it in, so the reduction is done. And then that guide comes out. A new guide goes into the same pinholes. So everything should be lined up just where it was before for the implant placement on the bottom left and the final on the bottom right. So just one example of, of a full arch, uh, kind of quote unquote stackable, non-stackable guide. Um, that's something that I designed myself using segmentation and blue sky bio and design and printed everything yourself. So much, much less expensive, uh, but more tedious than maybe having a lab do the whole thing for you. But nonetheless, printed on a sprint ray and the total cost to me out, out the door was like $40. And I, what I ended up getting was a, a guide to put implants in at the right angle and the right depth and everything else. So um, you can leverage this technology as, as much or as little as you want or use a lab to do a lot of this for you. Okay, so what about some uh, more exotic uses? So I showed the model earlier, but we'll look at it one more time. This is that patient we've been looking at. This is the entire cranial base and the maxilla. So we could take a look. Let's say we decide to get the zygomatic implants, okay? Because we want to do big flaps and get near the eyeball. We can take a look at this patient's zygoma and even do a practice model surgery. Is this going to be a Zaga 1, 2, 3, 4? Are we going to be going through the sinus, riding the sinus out in, in the buccal space? Um, you know, where in the zygoma are we going to be aiming? You know, what about the nasal floor? Are we going to be engaging the nasal floor? Are we going to go transnasal? Are we going to go through and up here and engage this little bone here, the inferior concha? Okay. Um, a good friend and faculty mentor um, and colleague of mine, Dan Holtzclaw, has a book coming out the next year that's all about exotic remote anchorage, zygomas, pterygoids, and transnasals. And having, a, having an example like this of your patient would make it a lot easier to decide which one to go for. How about the pterygoids? All the way back behind the tuberosity, these little pterygoid plates where the muscle attaches. We can be aiming for that pyramidal process that's just a little bit 
on the medial surface of that medial plate. Um, knowing where they are, what angle we need to approach, you know, from through the tuberosity, how low of an angle, it's important to have something like this to be able to actually uh, gauge that. So here on the slide, you can see if we're practicing for a pterygoid, we're staying under the sinus through the tuberosity and we're angling kind of in medial and superior at 30 to 45 degrees to hit that. Okay, so it's nice to have that model. And like I said, zygomas as well, fixating the cranial base on there is great. Subperiosteal implants, not as many of these are done anymore. They're actually kind of making a bit of a comeback thanks to this technology, but it used to be that if, if a patient had no bone above the nerve, like in this case, your only option was to do a subperiosteal, which was basically a metal framework that was fixated in with smaller pins, and then it had a pre-basically cast abutment. So you can see on the, on the bottom left, or the two left side pictures, you can see the pre-cast abutments. And so the previous way of doing this, though, was really kind of gruesome. What you, you would do a full thickness flap, as big as you could, expose all the bone, nerve, lingual undercut, all the way down to the myelinoid muscle, and take an impression of the bone, a direct bone impression with polysulfide or something like that. And then you'd suture them up and say, that was surgery number one. It was just for the impression. Now the bone impression, and I hope it's a good one because you don't want to do that again, goes to the lab and they do a wax up cast and they cast this subperiosteal implant. Patient comes back, flap the same flap again, very aggressive flap, place this in, suture it up, fantastic. Okay, how can we mitigate that? Well, gosh, now that we can do this bone segmentation, whether it's artificial intelligence or with the lab, we don't have to do that first appointment where we flap the patient wide open just to get an impression. We already have a very accurate bone model on our CBCT. And so our first surgery with this patient can be the placement of the subperiosteal implant, uh, which is a lot friendlier to the patient and less morbidity because we're not going back and forth and back and forth. So these are starting to get a little more popular. I mean, I didn't see these my entire career. I had one in my practice. I didn't do it. I just remember seeing it, thinking, what is that? That looks wrong. Uh, not realizing what it was. And I'm starting to see some surgeons start to pick this back up a little bit thanks to this technology. So um, exciting stuff. So what about pathology? Okay, here we have a case where the patient comes in and they're getting paresthesia on the lower right lip. Uh, I can see why the abscess from number 29 is congruent with the IA. Like I, you can't even see the border anymore. So it's hard to even know where the cyst stops and the nerve starts. And this is the kind of case where the consents start to get kind of long, um, especially the fact that the patient already had some transient paresthesia. Um, and so how do we better visualize this surgical approach? Well, certainly we can bone segment the, the mandible out. Here's the slices of the CBCT and we can see that cyst rests right on top, almost entirely encompasses the nerve canal. Okay, so we're a little bit concerned about that and how we're gonna get in there and remove that cyst. So here's our 3D um, bone segmented model. And I've got that model here. You can see she also has a lot of infection here in the front. These teeth are not even in the bone anymore. Um, but in this model alone, you really can't see the cyst, right? It's inside the bone. So here we've increased the translucency just in this digital rendering. And we're going to go ahead and we're going to say, okay, let's go ahead and do our reduction. because We're going to do some alveoloplasty here. Anyway, let's go ahead and do our digital reduction, just kind of cut it across the top, and then take a look at where that hollow model is, because then we're going to do about that much in the mouth, right? So now we can see this massive cavern. And as we map the nerve, now we see that nerve, of course, we kind of knew this already from the CBCT, runs right through that cyst, okay? So here's maybe a better view of that cyst on the side. Now, we went ahead and printed that in a clear resin. So if we can see my camera right here, apologize for that, let me get the shadow off of it. We can appreciate the nerve canal. Hopefully you can see that. Well, it looks just like what's on your screen. And so we can actually see where that nerve runs and the, the cyst or the massive lesion that's right over the top of it, okay? So here was our plan, not that we weren't gonna do implants, we just have to make sure we take care of the pathology as well. And so plan is to do four implants in between the foramen, clean out all this infection, and just put PRF or collagen plugs in that. We're not gonna put any particulate down near the nerve. Um, so that's our pre-op CBCT slice. Here it looks like, this is what it looks like in the mouth. You know, it's not like 
patient's not really swollen. If it weren't for the CT and the patient interview, we wouldn't maybe not have known how involved that nerve space was. So all root tips, root tips are removed. We start to do our flap release. Okay, we do our uh, alveoloplasty just like we did digitally. So here it is in the mouth. Okay, so there's as it's interesting that as you're doing alveoloplasty on the socket, the socket gets bigger, right? So here's our big cystic um, lesion. And then I'm going to jump over to the video so we can see the video of the surgery here too. Okay, so here's a video of the surgery right at the end when we're actually taking out the cyst. Referencing this model, being very mindful with the curette not to be in the inferior border of the cyst, just teasing it off the walls so we can get the cyst out. Just lightly teasing it. And if we can get this out in one piece, we'd prefer to, just because then we know we're not interfering with the nerve. It shouldn't be wrapped up in the nerve, just right on top of it. So get the final little granulation attachment off here. And you can see pretty big cyst, right? But it's night. We never touched the inferior border of where the cyst was, and it came out in one piece. Very, very happy. Good prognosis for that patient. Okay. All right. And then we continued with the surgery. Um, like I said, PRF in the back, no particulate in that hole that was near the nerve. Four implants right where we planned them. Um, you know, after cleaning out all the cysts, called the patient um, two days later. She was still slightly numb in that area. Called her a week later, said it was improving every day. And so um, she had full res full improvement of uh, the paresthesia within one month, which is fantastic. So what do we do with that cyst? Well, we send it to a pathologist, in this case to Dr. Carl Allen, who was actually wrote the book on pathology and taught me at Ohio State, um, came back. You know, this was a periapical cyst. Great. Just got to get that confirmation. If you're going to take something out like that, make sure you um, cover your butt and cover the patient's butt and uh, send that off to pathology and get, some, get it officially read. All right, so join us in the cutting edge. You know, if you're not already, if you're on the fence about 3D printing, um, maybe this will tip you over. And I think this is one of those things that's kind of on the, on the far scale of kind of things you can do with it, but it's really, really cool, especially if you're doing these bigger surgeries. Um, and there's just more and more applications for this stuff coming out every week, I feel like, every month, certainly. Um, but Sprint Ray 3D printing, the ecosystem they've developed is just really streamlined for the GP office. Uh, my staff run mine. I really don't have to mess with it unless I'm tinkering with something. Um, so yeah, hopefully this was an idea or, or a technique or a use of this you haven't seen before. Um, but yeah, let me know kind of what you thought. If you, if you want to follow me, I'm on Instagram mostly at Vorhol DDS. Uh, my website, stephenvorholdds.com, just kind of follows along my my path and whatnot. And then I teach at thepathway.com if you want to do some of the courses live and in person. So thank you very much for joining me. Hopefully, like I said, that was uh, interesting and new and maybe a, a use case you hadn't seen before. And I would love to answer all of your questions. Thank you, Dr. Vorhol, for a wonderful presentation this evening, and thank you all for joining us tonight. We are now going to jump into the live Q&A session.